Kelly Shudo, and I've been an actor for, well, a really long time. Here's my number. Call me. I've worked with some of the most famous people in Hollywood. Anything unusual occur? Define unusual. And taken on some roles I'd rather forget. Now my industry friends join me with their stories of faking it, making it, and taking it in Hollywood. And now, here's Nelly. Welcome to 50 Moments, Faking It, Making It, and Taking It in Hollywood as a Working Actor. And today I have a great guest on the show, and what we're going to talk about is when you pour your heart, your soul, and all your money into a project, and then it implodes. So I co-directed a film with my friend Jimmy Baberi uh, about 15 years ago, and we got all the funding. This great writer I knew wrote the script. It was, you know, a great, it was a very well-written script. We got actors like uh, John Aniston. We got Dr. Dre. We got people to invest money. It was very professionally done. And then at the 11th hour, the writer, who had all the rights, decided not to release the film because she wanted a theatrical release which is hysterical, hysterical today because if you think about it, nobody gets a theatrical, theatrical release and streaming is much more important. So, um, you know, a lot of things happened along the way. Again, uh, like for example, I hired my husband's friends to be extras and we were in a club and we were shooting very early in the morning, but apparently they had been out all night partying and were doing lines on a table. So we had to can them. Uh, number two, um, I had uh, Dr. Dre, like I said, we hired Dr. Dre, and so excited, I had a topless scene with him, and it turned out it was the wrong Dr. Dre. So the writer had hired D-O-C-T-O-R Dre instead of D-R Dre, and we spent all of our money flying him in, putting him up, all of his special requests, uh, everything that, it, you know, his budget, you know, his, his salary, et cetera, went into his, you know, into... Dr. Dre, and he was the wrong one. So uh, it just, the whole thing imploded. It never got released. We put all this love, energy, time into this project, and it still has not seen the light of day. So um, today, I have a great guest on. I have Charlie Leventhal, a friend of mine for years, a colleague for years. We've worked on many projects from theater to film to TV, and uh, we had a similar experience. So Charlie, let me welcome you to the show. Thank you for having me. Of course. Welcome to the show. So, That's Charlie, we did this play years ago. First of all, tell us about your background. I mean, you've, you've worked with the greats. You've worked with Scorsese. You've worked with Brian De Palma. You, were, you started out very young in the business at Sarah Lawrence, correct? I, st I started, I was making movies at 10. Mm -hmm. And um, when I went to Sarah Lawrence, I was incredibly lucky. Brian De Palma had been there years before. And he did something that I don't think had ever been done. Instead of teaching a class, he came back and we actually made a feature film. And we had uh, Vincent Gardenia was in it and Kirk Douglas was in it and Keith Gordon. And at 20 years old, I was the casting director and one of the writers. And then on the set, I sat next to De Palma and learned. And then after the film was over, I showed him a movie I had made about my freshman year at Sarah Lawrence, and he really liked it, and we wound up making it as a professional film, and he was like my executive producer, so uh, I was very fortunate. Okay, what are the names of the first film and the second film? What were they called? The First Time. Yes. It was about a young, shy guy that goes to an all-girls college, which was my life. Yes. And then the second film was um, My Demon Lover for mm -hmm. uh, New Line. And who was in that? You had a lot of good people in that. Uh, Scott, the, the really interesting thing is um, Meg Ryan was supposed to be the female star. And uh, we, had, we had known each other a really long time. And I could not get them to approve her. And finally, I got them to approve her. And then a week later, she had to drop out to do big film for Spielberg. And... Um, we wound up with a sitcom star named Scott Valentine at, from Family Ties mm -hmm. and, you know, some other pretty cool people, but it was a big drop off. And then I had also, we had tried to get Jay Leno and some really interesting people, but hey. No, it's so exciting because it's great to think of somebody mentoring you at that age and really providing these opportunities for you. Yeah, no, he was amazing. He, he taught me 
pretty much everything. And, um, and when we did a casting, he, he came in at the end and he approved all the actors and he um, came into editing. That was one of the greatest experiences. He came into the editing room with his editor, who was the editor of the original Star Wars. And literally in three hours, I got a, a lifetime education because I couldn't believe how what they could do. And it stuck with me all these for all these years. It was it was like going to film school for 20 years, that three yeah. hours. Well, of course, the the hands-on experience is the most important. And uh, I think about how good you've been to me. We've worked together on many projects, but what comes to mind is that great play we did. What was it called? It was a series of plays. It was called Women in Control, written by a guy. Yes. Who wrote it? I did. Yes. (laughs) Who directed it? I directed it, yes. Yes. (laughs) So tell us about uh, it. Tell us about the cast, because you had a great cast in that, including me. so we originally, I did these plays in New York and I had a, a, a soap opera stars. I uh, had some friends that were on soaps and um, in those days, New York had a lot of soaps and the younger actors wanted to do other stuff. So I wound up with like an all-star soap opera cast and they were really good actors. And then when I moved out to LA, I wanted to do something similar. It was a three one acts about relationships. And so we, there was a, there was a, a teacher. I, I, I'm thinking it was your teacher at the time too. I think, mm-hmm. and she helped us uh, with the cast. Mm-hmm. And actually, I met um, Julian McMahon, who obviously became incredibly well known for Nip Talk and now FBI Most Wanted. He was one of the students, so um, that's how I met Julian, and we've stayed friends and business associates for. 20 plus years since then. Mm-hmm. And we, we also had Allison Eastwood in the cast. Clint Eastwood's and daughter. Clint yes. Clint Eastwood's daughter. And um, we, and then there was a great actress named Nellie Shuto. Oh, who? That would be <laughs> you. Yes. And you, you actually produced the play with me. I did. I did put yes. it together with you. And in doing so with all those, you know, celebrities, et cetera, I said to you, Charlie, Please, please, please hire my friend. She will, you know, line produce the play. Please give her a part. A part, and there was no part for her. So you wrote a part for her, correct? Yes. So we. I thought it was pretty clever. So it was a bunch of one acts, and there's in between one acts you have to redo the set, the stage, and there's about a five seven minute. So I thought it'd be really funny to have a character come out before the play and in between each of the one acts and basically talk to the audience. And she, she starts out very friendly. She tells us that she's an actor and she kind of doesn't understand why she's in the play, but you know, she was cool. And then as the night goes on, she starts getting angrier and angrier about not being in the play. And by the end, she's supposed to literally like, you know, go crazy about what a bad guy I am. And, get the audience on her side and give them resumes. And so that, that was the plan. Well, it was such a creative way of drawing her in and drawing the audience in. And, um, you know, during rehearsals, I remember her sort of climbing over the, the chairs, et cetera, and uh, handing out her headshot and resume. And it made it really funny. It was like a desperate actress looking for work from the audience. That, that right? was the intent, yes. But what happened? It went horribly wrong. (laughs) It's opening night. We're all in the theater. We're backstage. You're sitting in the audience with your friends. And what happened? So I have to say, very rarely have I had an experience where an actor didn't trust me. I've usually been able to garner trust from actors. And I I could kind of tell that she was a bit hesitant, but I tried to work her through it. And so I thought we were good. And then the play opens, I'm sitting in the back and she comes on the stage and literally (laughs) she completely threw out the script. She ad-libbed the entire opening monologue. I I couldn't even believe it. I'm sitting there. And what was worse is it didn't work at all. It it was a complete disaster. No, it was like. the. I I remember because we were backstage, but I remember I was like, oh, my God, everybody's like, (gasps) Nobody's laughing. Well, it did not work. Well, that's the, you know, the great thing about theater, as you know, especially comedy is people laugh and it's like heaven. And if they don't laugh, it's like hell. And there's nothing in between. 
So when you open your show that you've worked so hard on with complete silence, and you know that you didn't even write it, but everybody thinks you wrote it and directed it, it was rather horrifying. And then she came back two more times. I guess I didn't think I could get backstage to to tell her not to do anymore. I kept hoping that she would get back. And each time she came out was worse. And it, it literally, I would crawl. I was like wanting to hide under the seat. And I remember after the, the rest of the show actually went pretty well. But I remember a couple of friends came up to me and they said, that was really good. And then there was a long pause and they were like, except for that one actress who, <laughs> We didn't understand what they were doing. It really didn't work. You might want to rethink that. No, it is. Well, a couple of things about it. A, that was my acting teacher. And, um, you know, I, I brought in Jen, the person who did the monologue, excuse me, and I brought in the acting teacher. And it was funny because I remember she was the kind of acting teacher who told you, if you don't come to me constantly, you're going to fail. You know, that kind of thing. Like, if you don't do what I say, you're going to fail. And it got in my head so much. But then I reached a point where I thought to myself, enough of this. I'm not doing any more acting classes where somebody tells me if I don't come to them, I'm going to fail. Like, the whole idea is to build you up and boost your confidence, not to make you feel like you're going to fail. But two yeah. other things that I learned from that play. Okay. There was, there was great joy and great sadness that opening night for me. Great sadness because you blew me up. Because it was my fault that we hired this person. And you were livid and screaming at me. <laughs> Which I, I understand. Screamed? Oh you were my screaming. God. I, I understand you had every right to. But then a happy thing happened. After the play, I get a knock on my dressing room door, and it's Clint Eastwood. And he comes to the door to tell me how great I was. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> that, that's, yeah, I got to shake. He shook my hand also. Yes. That, that was pretty cool. I mean, you know, you're doing a, a small theater, 99 mm -hmm. seats, and to have a, a legendary guy like him, you know, who came to see his daughter. But yes. He was, but he was very uh, kind and uh, supportive. And that was, you know, you don't never forget something like that. No, you don't. And Alison Eastwood was amazing in it. She's a great actress. She was a, a real contributor and a team player. She was great. You know, just she was great. And contrast was with a, the other it, end, it, right? It was a fun experience, though, because Alison had never done theater. Well, she, she did a great film. job. Yeah. And so it was, it was, the, it was, a, it was the, the most challenging thing, which was a lot of fun, was she just didn't, she didn't really realize how you have to position yourself so that the audience could always see you because she was used to doing film. Yeah. So we were, that was like the challenge was to get her to learn. And she actually did a great job and um, she was a lot of fun and uh, super cool, super cool woman. Who's now a, a big, big, she runs up besides her acting and stuff. She um, is an animal advocate. She runs a, uh, a rescue, which is very, very well known in LA. We just want to say well, of course, and you rescue animals, so it's nice. You rescue yes. dogs, you always have, which is great. So speaking of all that and helping people, you're doing something amazing right now. You're working with Kevin Lau on a project. Tell us about that. So Kevin Lau, who has now changed his name to Kevin Atlas. Okay. I don't know if you even knew that. I did not know that. Um, so Kevin, I met Kevin doing a documentary many years ago. Amazing story. He's the first person ever to play college basketball with one hand. Mm -hmm. And the documentary was absolutely a beautiful film. We opened in New York and L.A. And it was just one of the best experiences I've ever had in my life. People loved the film and we would get lots of kids that would come. And a lot of the kids had disabilities and we do a question and answer after. And to see the look on those faces, it was, it was one of the highlights of my life to feel like I was involved in something important. And I, Kevin and I became very close and decided we should keep working together. So we've been working on his feature version of the, of the film, which we're excited about. And we just shot a pilot uh, for a television show, which I think is uh, got huge upside. And what's interesting about it, the concept is pretty simple. Kevin, who's now about 29, is like the old time Willie Loman for those that might know who Willie Loman is. He's like the old time guy who he's, a, he's been one of the biggest inspirational speakers in the country for high schools. Mm -hmm. But he goes 
town to town, school to school, you know, airport to airport, gymnasium to gymnasium. He talks to 300 kids, 500 kids, sometimes a thousand or 2000, but and he, he's gone to maybe a thousand, more than a thousand schools over the years. And so Kevin is making a big difference in the world, but he sometimes feels like he could make a bigger difference. So Kevin knew this, uh, this other young man who has a company that works with influencers, social media influencers, which I knew little about. And we got to know this other guy and we, what they do and so the, it was a very simple idea. Let's match up Kevin with some of the biggest social media influencers in the country. We learn about the social media influencers. And then Kevin will tell them about a school that he visited and challenge this each influencer to make a difference. So on the first episode, we have an amazing guy who's also our executive producer. His name's Adam Wahid. And Adam has about 17 or 18 million followers across all his platforms, TikTok, Instagram, and uh, who also has a great story of how he wanted to be an actor and then fell into this. And Kevin comes to visit Adam, tells Adam about the school. Uh, he, there's a school in Louisiana that's one of the poorest schools in the country. And Kevin talks about his frustration that he, 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 you know, he talked to the kids, he made a bit of difference, but he'd like to do more. And he enlists Adam. And within days, Adam got us a grant. And we took the crew and Adam and Kevin, and we went to the school. And we did a complete makeover on big parts of their school. They had a basketball court that was weeds and dirt and a, believe it or not, a, 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 a basketball rim had no hoop. So this is about as bad as you could get. And we built them the most, I wish I could show you a picture, but it looks like a, a, a professional court with sports material, just beautiful. And we also built them a fitness center. We built them a game room. And then to honor the teachers, we um, completely redid their teacher's lounge, which was in bad, bad shape. So it, it was an amazing experience. Um, we financed and shot the pilot ourselves. We have a, a tremendous team representing the project and we're finishing it up. And um, the goal is to get it on air and then each episode, Kevin will be with a different influencer and they'll visit a different school. And hopefully we're gonna change a lot of lives. Well, it's an incredible thing to do these days when you think post-COVID, et cetera, especially. There are so many schools in need. Uh, and I love that, you know, Kevin, who's, um, you know, always been very inspirational, is giving back now through you guys. Like, together, you guys are giving back to schools, which is such an important infrastructure issue these days. Um, but also just the idea of social influencers. When we were talking earlier, when I said about this person who was the writer on the movie – all she wanted was a theatrical release. And it really wasn't that important. What was important was to get it out, to get the story out. It was about a drug addict. It was to get the story out, but she refused to do that. And it's interesting when you talk about uh, like streaming, et cetera, when you talk about social media, it's the same idea, how you get your story out. And that has changed tremendously in the past you know, 10 years. You know, yeah, as you know, when we started out, everybody wanted to do features. TV yes. was like, you know considered a secondary and now it's probably the opposite everybody wants to do show for netflix or amazon or hulu and the other thing that's even more exciting is i went to a college a few years ago um your friend and mine steve greenwald had mm -hmm. me talk to some of the film students and what i said to them which i now know a lot more about is don't do what we did that's the old way where mm -hmm. you you try to get in the door, you try to get an agent, you try to pitch. You, you can do that, but honestly, with the technology and all the, all the outlets that you can reach to directly to audiences, you should empower yourself. And what's amazing, what I, I didn't know that much about uh, the, the social media world, but I've met some of these people now, and I'm actually in awe of what they do. Uh, the one fellow that I just told you about, Literally, he, he's like his own studio. Every week he does five comedy videos. 
and they're really good. Mm -hmm. But instead of pitching it to someone and asking for permission, I want people to see it. He, they, they know what to do. They post it and he gets millions and millions of views. And they, he, on one little kind of comedy stunt that he did, I believe it's, they got 150 million views. Wow. Which is just, I, it's mind boggling, right? But what's so cool is this is the life of these, you know, they're doing their thing. So he's, he's doing his comedy. He has an audience and he doesn't need somebody to tell him it's okay. No, and I love that. My son's had a YouTube channel since he was eight and he makes all of his own videos. He does a lot of jackass ish stuff. And now he started making movies. Like I'll come home and there, there are people in my bedroom you know, with blood and they're shooting a horror film. I'm like, what's going on in my bedroom? <laughs> like he's always doing something. Now he needs to learn how to, how to post it, how to get viewers, et cetera. You know, but it's fascinating to talk about that. And like, listen, what you're doing is great, Charlie. You've been in the business for years and you've always adapted well, which I think is amazing. Like it is the, the only way to last in our business to, is to adapt. So um, tell our audience how they can find anything on this Kevin Lau story, Kevin Atlas. Well, the best is just to look up Kevin Atlas and go to his website, and then you can learn all about Kevin. And then um, we hope to be out selling the show uh, in the end of October. And, um, you know, nothing's ever a guarantee, right? But it's so, it's so interesting because we're partnered with these two content providers, these two young men who have a company, and they work with about 15 other influencers and we, we're pretty confident we'll get eight or so on the first season. So it's, it is mind boggling again. But if you add up the followers of their eight people, we would be at about 250 million followers. Which is incredible. I mean, is, yeah. Uh, I just, yeah, it's crazy. Okay. So in addition, Charlie, in addition to this TV show, uh, you also have a Kevin Lau feature, correct? Yes. It's, uh, so basically... The documentary, it's based, you know, it's based on the documentary, but then we go behind the scenes in a much more depth. And it's been an interesting journey. Um, the director of the documentary, who was an amazing guy, and we all loved, unfortunately, he passed away at a very young age. And so it, for Kevin and I, it, it's become something like, you know, it's like, an absolute must that we have to get a feature done based on the documentary and honor Franklin Martin, who is our friend. Mm -hmm. And so it's been an interesting road. We made a deal with uh, WWE. Wow. Uh, World Wrestling Entertainment. And they hired a, a, a very good writer and we got a good script, but this, it never came together. So what happened was, um, we got the rights back. And one of the people that Kevin, Kevin's met a lot of people over the years. And um, he met one of the, probably one of the most prolific, successful writers in the business named Billy Ray, best known for Hunger Games. And he did the James Comey thing that was on recently. And he's, he's, he's working with Scorsese and he just basically asked him to godfather us to just kind of be our, just be there for us. So we we're very, very incredibly fortunate that he agreed. And then Kevin asked me to work on the script. And I was very hesitant about it because I've always done comedy. But he kept saying, I know you can do it. So it was actually one of the great gifts because I had an amazing time working on the script and I think we have a, a really good script. We went into depth about a lot of things that weren't in the documentary. Um, and then we also now feature Kevin as the inspirational speaker. And then at the end, it's kind of touching because several of the people that were in the documentary, besides uh, Frank, um, have passed away. Kevin's mom, who was... Uh, amazing woman who was the strongest figure in his life. She passed away. One of the coaches that really helped Kevin. So at the end, it's kind of an homage to all of these wonderful people. So right now we've got our script and we're talking with a producer that um, 
I'm going to leave unnamed at the moment, but he um, has a film going at Netflix and he's very excited about the project and we're strategizing now how to add elements, the director and so on. So I'm, uh, I'm really hopeful that we can um, get Kevin's story to a larger audience. Well, it's so inspirational. It really is all around. Uh, and I just love the way you're, you're, you've got it in so many different mediums, right? I mean, I remember you traveling around uh, with the documentary, going to New York City and having live audiences. You met my family there for that. You know, you've, you've just done a lot to really promote this project and it deserves it. I will say that he's having Kevin and Kevin in my life has been an amazing thing. And as you know, uh, what comes around goes around. So when Kevin got married, his, you know, both his parents had passed away and he gave me the honor of giving a speech that normally a mom or dad would give. And then a few months later, it was my time to get married. Mm -hmm. uh, unbelievable miracle, of course, that I, I found someone fantastic. And um, Kevin performed, as you were there, so Kevin performed the service, as you remember. So I don't think anyone has ever seen a seven foot one armed wedding officiant before. <laughs> no, it was a beautiful, it was a beautiful wedding. It was so full of joy and so much fun. And Kevin, he was amazing, right? Yes, he was amazing. He was amazing. So, you know, it's been, having Kevin has been amazing. The other thing, going back to the um, influencers, now you have a son, mm -hmm. I don't have kids, so it's a uh, incredible, I'm, I'm surrounded by people in their twenties. So it, every once in a while I feel very old, but most of the time I just feel grateful for their energy. Uh, how about and, feeling knowledgeable? Don't you feel knowledgeable? Cause you can I, share that with them. Yeah, I do. I do feel knowledgeable. And I, I, the relationship is so interesting because their world is so different than what we have done, right? Mm -hmm. So if you go watch what they post, they're geniuses at short form. I mean, super short form, 30 seconds, 45 seconds, occasionally a minute. And so we, as we're doing this show, it's been really, you know, it's been a, a quite a, a, an interesting challenge for the, for us to try to speak the same language because they are so focused on the pace. And on the one hand, I respect that because they know their core audience. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I try to pull out of them the idea that this will have a bigger audience and that, you know, you, you need to let things play a little bit and let, let them run a little longer than you're used to. So it's been a, it's been a very, I think, enlightening experience for all of us. Well, that reminds me of growing up watching 70s movies, because 1970s movies like Three Days on the Condor, those movies were all about people just talking to each other and no action, right? Then we went to action films where there's something happening constantly, right? And now we're in short form, uh, short form media, which is very different as well. It's much more fast paced, as you said. You know, and like, how do you adapt to that? I think they all have their own value, right? But yeah. yeah. Well, I think what's cool about what we're both learning is there's a place for both. Yes. And I'm hoping on the show we will find the happy medium where the pace is has a pace that their young audience will appreciate and they won't get bored in six seconds. But I hope <laughs> that I'm able to have a, a few areas where we stretch a depth a little bit. And I, because I do think the, there's a much bigger audience for a show like that. No, I think you should just wear a bikini whenever you're shooting. Okay. That should get people's attention. <laughs> um, I'm going to put some thought into that. <laughs> I, I never thought of that. That's why they pay you the big dollars. Exactly. Well, Charlie, you've been the best guest and you know, you've been the best friend. We've worked together and known each other for more years than I'd like to say, uh, but we've covered just about every medium and this is a new one for us. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. And if, uh, if I did yell at you on the play, I would like to officially apologize. <laughs> you yelled at me, but you were right. And it was just in the moment. And after that, it all worked out, right? Okay. As it always so does. Sorry. No <laughs> one should ever yell at Nelly, ever. <laughs>
Guys, thank you so much for watching 50 Moments, Faking It, Making It, and Taking It in Hollywood as a Working Actor. My guest today was Charlie Leventhal, a longtime friend and colleague. And next time, we'll have somebody else interesting for you as well. Thanks so much for watching. For information on my book, check out nelliesblog.com. And I'm on all social media platforms. Just search for Nellie Shudo.